Hello, termites. Well, I'm glad. I'm going to clean my glasses while I talk to you. My, um, these are from Walgreens. They're Foster Grants. Wasn't it Wonder Woman who did the ads? Have you seen me in Foster Grants? Or was it Jacqueline Smith? I don't know. Um, as you can see, we're down a termite. The worthy termite, Senior Black, has been deposited at a different safe house um, with his friend. So he's good because he doesn't want to go back to New York City. He would like to wander the earth like Jesus until it's time when he feels the city is, quote, normal. I didn't want to say that could be quite a while, but maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe we'll get a vaccine like on Tuesday. That'd be cool, right? What are we drinking? Well, this, my friends, is a little sexton. What? It's a little uh, product of Ireland. It's a single malt Irish whiskey distilled in copper pots. I did not mule this back. This is uh, imported by a company in New Jersey, and you can get it here in the States, no problem. So we'll start out with a little bit of that. I'll tell the missing termite that I'm sure many of you missed his contribution. I'm sorry you couldn't hear him on that one. It's because I was hogging. This is the mic I have, and I was hogging it. Not on purpose. I just didn't realize it didn't do that. All right. We're back. Tanya's falling on kind of hard times because, well, you know, she's just not on the road that much, and she makes her money touring, as I make my money touring. And uh, there's no touring right now, so... Let's be careful on, um, you know, wasting things. Did you guys see my video about my Crest toothpaste? Pretty proud of that victory. And then one of you, not sure who, told me that I had not gotten all the toothpaste out. If I took a butter knife and went, <laughs> there would be more in there. And said person was correct because I went and did it because then I became obsessed with I didn't really finish it. And that was the whole goal. It's finished now and it's in the trash. And uh, I've been to CVS to get these. 17 bucks for these. It's a little high, don't you think, for reading glasses? And I bought the wrong number. Why? Because I couldn't read the number while I was buying reading glasses. Because mine broke, and I tried to Gorilla Glue them, and I really only glued my finger to the glasses. It was a whole little incident. Okay. <clears throat> in the spring of 1982, I was in high school then. I received a call from an old CBS contact, Clyde, da Clive Davis. Well, hello. We know Clive, who, who headed CBS Records. And when I was on Columbia and was running Artista Records by then, he, he was very interested in starting a Nashville-based division of the company. He wanted to sign me as his first uh, uh, country artist and have David Malloy produce the record. David was a guy who started out of the business at a very young age and was considered a sort of a wonder kind. W-U-N-D-E-R. One wonder. When David produced my, al my uh, album, he was still in his 20s. I flew to Nashville and met with him, uh, him and met with my new... I'm sorry. I'm not even drunk. I flew to Nashville and met with my new producer, and I should have known from the beginning that, like in that line in Cold Hand Luke, we had a lack of communication. Oh, no. Clive believes you're a torch singer at heart, Tanya, Tanya, David told me right off the bat. That's the direction he wants you to go. What the fuck is a torch singer? Never heard of it. Well, I'm planning on making a country record, I told him, and I'd already tried to change my music once, and it hadn't worked. I couldn't see how little torchy torches could enhance certain... I could see how little torchy torches could enhance certain songs, but not all of them. I don't know what a torchy torch either is, because I sure I don't even know what a torch is, more or less a torchy... To, torchy touches. Oh, torchy touches. I could see how little torchy touches could enhance... What's a torchy touch? I feel like I'm in a very peculiar position, David admitted, because as far as I know, your musical heroes range from Elvis to George Jones, and you want to make a country record. Clive's wanting a torch-flavored album. Does that mean sexy? Were they afraid to just say sexy? I mean, what, what are you, five? Just say it. I don't get it. We may have a little problem with the creative direction here. 
We'll handle it, I laughed, thinking despite my, all my experience that things would work themselves out once we got in the studio. Well, we know better. We know better. As George Bush said, for one, fool me once, that's on me. Fool me twice, that's on me too. Exactly. I've usually got enough confidence for two or three people. I knocked over a period of... I recorded over a period of several months in 1982, and I flew in and out of Nashville for the song selection meetings and actual recording sessions. The album took longer to make than any before or since, and a lot of the reason is my fault. I like it when she just owns up. I was crazy. But there's a detachment, like her isn't actually her. It didn't take long to find out that I didn't need to be in L.A. to find a party. Good for you. Whew, I'd like to hang out with her now. She's probably really a, probably still a fun party. Nashville had plenty of people running wild, and I was soon hanging out with the musicians and songwriters who cons songwriters who considered themselves to be hell raisers. That's such a term infrequently used anymore. Things have straightened up considerably in Nashville now, but back in the mid '80s, liquor and drugs were everywhere. And if you're an entertainer known to live on the edge, I'm not. For the record. I'm not. Neither is the termite that was here. My other termite, Mr. Ron White, he might be known to live on the edge, which is why sometimes he's fun and sometimes he's fun. I'm in the middle somewhere. I don't really live on the edge. <laughs> Look at me. I'm sitting here reading this book. Probably not real edgy. Uh, if you're an entertainer who, who's known to live on the edge, many people will do anything to see you out there. Club owners, promoters, musicians, and songwriters are only too happy to get high with you. Sometimes it's because they want to curry favor, but I think it's usually just for the show of it. I think people like to say, oh yeah, George Jones, I got drunk with him in San Antonio. Or man, Tanya and I did some blow the other night, and she is one wild woman. People have requested to have drinks with me, and I probably haven't ever said no, unless I had to actually physically leave the building. Drinks, yes. Sane. A, bu a bucket of blow? No. Not for me. But I'm glad she liked it for a while. That's not an excuse for the way I behaved. It's just the way things were back then. Okay, there's the disconnect. I'm talking about, no, no, you did do that. You did it. You did it. Back then, I did try to excuse some of my behavior, saying it was the liquor or drugs. I'd do something done and say, oh, man, I was just high. That doesn't fly anymore. I don't try to lay the blame on anything but the fact that I've stumbled again. When I came in for sessions or song meetings, I stayed at the Spence Manor rather than out at the ranch. I used the excuse that I needed to be close to the studio, but really I just wanted the freedom. The Spence is a music row hotel I referred to as the S&M since a lot of weird people came in and out of there, including me. See, once again, she owns up. The place has seen it all. They tell about the time Mickey Newbury, a legendary writer and rowdy, writer and rowdy, rowdy. That's how they describe Mickey Newbury, was walking along 17th Avenue towards the Spence, and George Jones staggered out of a car and into the lobby of a hotel. George hadn't closed the door of his car, and he'd left a paper bag filled with money lying, on the, uh, lying open on the seat. Mickey shot up to George's room and handed him the bag. What the hell is this, and why are you throwing it around your car seat, Mickey asked. Oh, yeah, the possum says. I forgot about that. Waylon loaned me $50,000 last night. Probably not the smartest thing Waylon ever did. Probably wish he'd thought about that twice. And then there was the time David Allen Coe checked in with the wife and kids and two chimpanzees. What? David Allen Coe traveled with two chimps? The chimps went crazy and tore up half of the third floor before they got them under control. That I would see. That I would do blow to see. And I, will, I always say I would never do cocaine because I've seen what it does to people. But I, if I had to, if you said, Kathleen, there's a line of coke. If you want to see the chimps dominating the third floor, you have to do it. I would do it once just to see that. I'm sorry I missed both of those shows at the S&M. Me too, Tanya. I'd give anything to see chimps just running wild at a hotel. I met two of my main running partners of that era, Dean Dillon and Gary Stewart at the Spence, during one of my first lessons. Laurel, a girlfriend of mine, 
was with me, and we were kicking back one night, lying around in our bathrobes and watching television. Suddenly, there was a big commotion that sounded suspiciously like a party out in the hall. Laurel ran over to the door and looked through the peephole. There's some guys in rock and roll jackets out there, she whispered. That aroused my curiosity, so I got the switchboard, the switchboard, to connect me to the room across the hall, called them up, and asked if they had any beer. Now, that's a normal question. Hey. Sounds like you're having a party. That has actually happened to me. Right before the road went silent, it actually happened in Boise in a Marriott courtyard. Truth be told, there were some kids out in the hall, maybe in their 30s. And they said, are we making too much noise? I said, no, I don't care what you do because I can sleep through anything. I don't care. And they said, well, if you're, you know, if you're still up, you want to come party with us? I didn't do it, um, mainly just because I had a flight to escape a pandemic quite early in the morning, and I thought if these flights don't go, I probably need to be a little bit on the ball, not hungover and dragging around with a, a boarding pass in my hand that's on a plane that's going nowhere. Um, well, I don't know, some guy said with a draw. I didn't know who was at the time. Are you good looking? We're okay, I laughed. That'll do, he said. I hung up the phone and told Laurel we better put on some makeup or we'd make out to be, we'd, we'd make, We'd make me out to be a liar. It took us a while to get dressed and fix our faces, so by the time we walked in the door, Dean, Gary, and another songwriter, Frank Dacus, were picking guitars and working on the song. They didn't even introduce themselves right away, just handed us a couple beers. Gary Stewart turned out to be the one who'd answered the phone. I recognized him immediately. He's one of the greatest singers and stylists in the business with hits like She's Acting Single, I'm Drinking Doubles. Nope, never heard of it. But I'm going to Google it. I have the time. And, quote, out of hand. I've always loved his music, so I was excited to meet him. It was so excited just to look at Dean Dillon because he's a fox. I actually have a real fox. And many of you have seen it here on Instagram. There's two, Ricky and Lucy. I didn't know who he was. Although he was so cute, I didn't know how I'd missed him around town. He had several singles out on RCA. And in 1981, Billboard voted him Singles Artist of the Year. They, Dean and Gary brought a duet album out. In 1982, Brotherly Love, and they were working on a new project. Those were the days. Those two were well known for their wild streaks as four of their musical talents. Just the guys, kind of guys I needed to meet. They were working on a song. The song they were working on while was about Natalie Wood, who died recently. Mm, sad song, I bet. It's probably going to involve drowning. Whew. Catalina. That's where she fell off the boat or was pushed off the boat. And you know what's in Catalina? A shitload of sharks. How do I know that? I've been there. I didn't get in the water. Okay, we're going to wrap this up in a minute. Termites, hang in there. It's getting good, though. It's always good. This book's just great. I listened to the line they were singing and said, Nah, that's not the best line you could come up with. Try this one. We sat around drinking beers and writing songs all night. The first song I completed with them was called Leave Them Boys Alone. It was about the music business trying to control artists and careers. Leave them boys alone and let them sing their songs. By the next morning, we were still up and all still trash, but we were all singing, and I thought we'd written a hit, so of course I wanted to tell the world. Of course, if I did that, I'd also be telling the world that Tanya Tucker was in the bag. <laughs> I didn't care. But I didn't want to stagger down the alley to Tree Publishing to announce I'd written a hit song, so I had Dean and Gary roll me over... Roll me over on a luggage cart. <laughs> I rolled in looking like God knows what and shouted, Hey guys, I wrote this song. Imagine if you were the lady who got to work at nine and had coffee and you've taken a shower and you look normal and this shit show rolls in on a luggage cart. That's a winner. I would hope shit like that happened every day if I had a boring office job. You know who makes your office less boring? Tanya Tucker. That's who. All right. I think that's probably about 10 minutes. Usually, that's what I try to do to break this up. Whew, I hope you termites are hanging in there. Things seem to be going a little bit in the wrong direction. Especially for some of you states, like Texas. My friend Termite, Termite White is in Austin right now. And he said some of the places are closing on their own. It's also about 104 degrees. Last I checked yesterday, he can't golf, so he's super sad. He's just sitting in his house with his dog. He said it was too hot for even the dog. 
He had to take Mustard, the French Bulldog, in the shower to cool him down. They were outside for approximately five minutes, and then, then, then the overheating starts. As he says, he has a fragile ecosystem. I said, I hope you let the dog shower alone. I don't think it should be traumatized. All right, termites. Hang in there. Maybe aliens will come. Now would be a good time for that, right? As long as we're in the middle of a shit show, maybe they're smarter than us. Maybe they can fix this. Everybody always thinks they're going to be evil. They don't know that. Maybe they're going to look down upon us and go, what a pathetic shit show. Let's go help them. Hmm? Positive thinking. Okay, termites. It's a little sad by myself. I don't mind being alone, but, you know, he was fun. So, in the words of who? Well, I'm taking it over. I got to take it over. I get to be Mama Termite now, and I just get to say it's my own. He gave it to me. So you all put your little summer sheet up. So hot as the devil most places. I know L.A. is going through a heat wave. The South. I don't know about the Northeast. I haven't talked to my New York people. I think it's hot there, too, though. So uh, get your summer sheet. Why not just take off all your clothes? You don't even need jamas. It's summer sleeping the way Jesus made you. Pull that sheet up. Tell yourself, I'm a good termite. I'm a worthy termite. That's it. Night-night termites.